<laughs> yes, Barat Saudeon. Good afternoon, buenas tardes. Um, I'm, I'm going to be moving between pieces of paper and my, my notes. And I hope you excuse me for that, but I think, think it is very important. Um, I'd like first to, to thank the Oberon Institute, Democratic Governance, San Telmo and Gavral Kucha for, for inviting me to speak this evening in this magnificent setting in San Sebastian, a magnificent, beautiful city, and at, at home uh, with the, um, with the Durangesa, where um, we often comment that um, if we won the pools or we won the lottery, we'd certainly buy a property in San Sebastian. But as we don't play the lottery and we don't do the pools, the possibility is quite remote. Um, that, that said, it's tremendous to be here this evening. I thank, thank you all for, for coming. Uh, a complicated subject, um, to say the least. And, and further complicated in, in, in my case, or in the case of all my colleagues um, related with uh, the government, uh, is the fact that we're in, in, a, in a state known as Perda. Uh, and I apologize for the state of Perda in the sense that when, when uh, Katerina very kindly approached us with respect to taking part in, in the event. Um, we didn't have uh, general elections on, on the horizon. And once we do have general elections on the horizon, we enter into a state of purda, uh, which puts uh, limitations, certain limitations on what we can say uh, today. Um, Perda, by the way, it's uh, a word of Persian origin, and uh, it means curtain or veil. And what it means is that um, during the Perda period, which is the lead up to, to the elections, uh, public servants, uh, like me, uh, can't comment on certain things or can't get involved in debates that might give the impression that we're trying to influence in the decision of the voter. It's a remarkably democratic process. Um, it's something that is uh, being looked at for the, the future, but I apologize if this evening there are there are points that maybe can't be, that I can't respond to simply because of the, the, the constraints of, of Purda. It's a tradition, it's been around for, for many years and uh, we have to respect it, obviously, um, whilst it's there. And we'll see after the next elections whether somebody decides to remove it. That said, that said, um, in summary, Till the 9th of June, I can't publicly speculate on future policies around Brexit as it corresponds to the future government to set the course uh, for the future. But what I, what I can speak about and what I'm going to speak about is the, the general context, the existing policies already announced because certain things have been announced and will be implemented independently of who wins the elections. And an example, an example. The fact that the United Kingdom will leave the European Union, given that all parties have made it clear that the result of the referendum will be respected. That I can say, because it's a fact. And what I hope this evening to do is talk about the facts that are there without any political colour. Article 50. Um, as Katerina said last month, the, 20, uh, the Article 50 
was triggered on the 29th of March. And it was triggered following the confirmation by the UK Parliament of the referendum results. Uh, by voting with clear and convincing majority in both houses uh, for the European Union notification of withdrawal. So accepted by the majority. The bill was passed on the 13th of March and received royal assent from Her Majesty the Queen and became an act of parliament on the 16th of March. Her letter of 29 March, which Katharina mentioned, which um, I have here. <laughs> Her letter of 29 March to President Donald Tusk, President of the European Council, set the wheels of withdrawal fully in motion. In the letter, she proposed principles for, this, for discussion to help make sure that the process is as smooth and successful as possible. But before, before the letter, before the letter, Mrs. May made a, a speech in Lancaster House in January. Uh, and in that, in that speech, what she, what she set out was the negotiating objectives uh, for exiting the European Union. But also, also what she did uh, in that speech uh, was to make a reference to what kind of a country do we want to be? And I, I'd like to read, if you don't mind, and excuse me for doing it in this manner, but I'd like to read what, what she said. And in reading it, uh, I'm not saying making any political judgment, valuation of it, but simply that this is what she said with respect to what kind of a country do we want to be. <clears throat> Here goes. My answer is clear. I want this United Kingdom to emerge from this period of change stronger fairer, more united, and more outward looking than ever before. I want us to be secure, prosperous, tolerant as a country. A magnet for international talent and a home to the pioneers and innovators who will shape the world ahead. I want us to be a truly global Britain, the best friend and neighbor to our European partners, but a country that reaches beyond the borders of Europe too. I want Britain to be what we have the potential talent and ambition to be, a great global trading nation that is respected around the world and strong, confident, and united at home. And that's what Mrs. May said about the country that she envisages, and she is the leader of the present government in, in the UK. And she also said, <laughs> our vote to leave European Union was no rejections of the values we share. The decision to leave the EU represents no desire to become more distant to the Union, our friends and neighbours. It was no attempt to do harm to the EU itself or to any of its remaining member states. It was a vote to re restore, as we see it, our parliamentary democracy, national self-determination, and to become even more global in action and in spirit. And then she went on in that speech, which 
was in January to describe the objectives, the objectives of what the negotiations will be. Again, this is there. It's not a, a value judgment, but there were 12, and are 12 objectives within that negotiating process. The, of the 12 objectives, the first objective is uh, certainty, to provide a sense of certainty. Uh, that, that is crucial. And what the government, the then government, wishes is to provide certainty wherever we can, and an example of that certainty, which Rocco and Katerina know more about than me, is, for example, the transposition of EU law to British law, so that when Brexit occurs, when the disengagement happens, the crossover between English law, EU law, will be smooth. And having that certainty, and I recognize, and maybe should not recognize, that the task is enormous in a very limited time span, but there is a dec declared intention to assure that certainty. And that, that's simply an example. A, a stronger Britain is one of the ambitions. That stronger Britain has to do with a control over our own laws. Taking control of our own affairs, which implies that the European Court of Justice and its role will no longer play a part in Britain, which also links into the single market, which we'll see later. So, an ambition to control our own laws. In fact, as Mrs. May said, or as the present government said, we will not truly have left the European Union if we are not in control of our own laws. Hence this dilemma with respect to the European Court of Justice. Strength of the Union, again one of the objectives, more important than ever to face the future together, which is evidently a reference to the, the fact that we are the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland. And a sign also of the, the wish, the desire, that that strengthening of the union uh, occurs was the setting up of the Joint Ministerial Committee on EU Negotiations. Scotland, Northern Ireland, Wales, England, talking about the negotiations. The negotiations are not being imposed by Whitehall. The fourth objective, and this is um, Rocco's subject. Also, by the way, my surname is Doyle, <laughs> uh, and I have Irish had Irish parents. So this one also has a, has a certain sentimental, I shouldn't say it, Perda uh, has a certain sentimental implication for me, which is maintain the common travel area with Ireland. It's an important priority for the UK, for the current, present UK government. And I, I know I keep making references to the present and current or actual government. That is the demands of Perda. Common travel, the common travel area has existed for many, many years. In fact, it existed before either uh, Ireland or the United Kingdom became members of the, the European Union. So that question, that issue, is a, is a priority. And the ambition is to find 
a, a practical solution. That was objective four. Objective five is to do with a, a fairer Britain. Uh, fair to everyone who lives and works in the country. And it also implies uh, control of immigration. Um, Britain is not throwing up barriers with respect to the ar arrival of immigrants. What it wishes to do is control immigration in a way that it has not. What its ambition is, is to continue to attract the brightest uh, and those that serve the national interest. And looking at immigration figures over the years, the influx in the UK proportionally has been quite high in comparison to other European countries. So a wish to control that. Objective six, uh, rights for EU nationals in Britain and British nationals in the, UE, in the EU. Interestingly, Katerina, you mentioned Barnier and one of his primary ambitions. It just so happens that that ambition coincides fully with Britain's ambition, uh, which is to guarantee the rights of EU citizens who are already living in Britain and the rights of British nationals in other member states. So in that respect, no, I can't say it, ray of hope. <laughs> Objective seven, uh, protect workers' rights. In a truly global Britain, in a truly global Britain which advocates free trade in the world, which leads into Objective 8, which is free trade with European partners. What she said in Lancaster House was that that free trade starts with your close friends. And our close friends are the EU member states. So we have a bold and ambitious or a desire for a bold and ambitious free trade agreement with the European Union. Uh, an ambition to have the greatest possible access, the greatest possible access to the single market, but on obviously a reciprocal basis. In that respect, if we look, for example, at trade between Basque country, or maybe we do that later, it's important. Ninth objective, new trade agreements with other countries. The freedom to strike trade agreements with countries outside the EU. Trade agreements at present are governed by the EU. So one of the ambitions within this movement is that the UK will be able to negotiate agreements with others on its own terms outside the EU. There are those that say that um, since joining the European Union, trade as a percentage of GDP has more or less stagnated in the UK, whether it's to do with membership of the European Union or not, I don't know, but there are those that say it might have something to do with it if you're not in control of your negotiating capacity. So one of the ambitions, one of the objectives is new trade agreements. Also, 
that commitment to new trade agreements led to the creation of what is called the Department for International Trade. And that's one of the hats I wear here in the north of Spain as director of that office and its activities for promoting trade and investment. Also around, around that concept of the Department for International Trade, starting new arrangements or negotiating new arrangements with third countries brings into question our membership of the customs union uh, and the implications that that might have and also commercial policy, the common commercial policy. They will have to be subject to negotiation but the objective is to reach agreements. Tenth objective, and one, one that I, what I think is particularly with respect to, to the Basque country, um, has to do with the objective of being the best place for science and in, for in innovation. Uh, a place in the world for science and innovation and science and innovation is about collaboration. Hence the reference to the Basque country, which invests 2.1, 2.2% of its GDP in, in research and development. And we have important relationships already in the field of research and development that obviously we want to, to continue uh, increasing. Eleven, and remember we're, we're talking about the objectives that were set out by Mrs. May in her speech in January in Lancaster House. So, uh, this is progressing. <laughs> but number 11, uh, cooperation in the fight against crime and terrorism. Crime and terrorism and foreign affairs cooperation, sharing intelligence, material with EU allies. That also is an objective uh, which is common to us all, that fight against uh, crime and terrorism. But also the ambition of a, a phased approach, a smooth, orderly Brexit. Uh, a, a Brexit that will be a new, strong, constructive, very important, constructive partnership for a strong EU and a strong UK. Now I'll go back, sorry for flashing about, but that was Lancaster House. And then since Lancaster House, what has happened has happened. And if I can find it, this is the letter that Mrs. May sent to Mr. Tusk. And in, in that letter, um, she, proposed, she proposed principles principles for discussion to help make sure that the process is as smooth and successful as possible. So we had the Lancaster House Declaration where the objectives of the negotiation were set out. And in her letter to Mr. Tusk, she sets out uh, some principles of how the negotiation could progress. And what, do, what does she say? We should engage with one another constructively and respectfully in a spirit of sincere cooperation. I think I, I repeat it because I think it's an important, an, important, an important statement. We should engage with one another constructively and respectfully in a spirit of sincere cooperation. First point, first principle. Two, we should always put our citizens first. Three, 
we should work towards securing a comprehensive agreement, agree a deep and special partnership. It's going to be something new, something that hasn't happened before, but deep and special partnership. We should work together to minimize disruption and give as much certainty as possible. People and businesses in both the UK and EU would benefit from implementation periods to adjust in a smooth and orderly way to new arrangements. In particular, we must pay attention to the UK's unique relationship with the Republic of Ireland and the importance of the peace process in Northern Ireland. Maintain the common travel area. We should begin technical talks on detailed policy ideas as soon as possible. But we should prioritize the biggest challenges we get back to the ambitious free trade agreement, financial services and network industries. The reference to network industries is a reference to the interconnection that the UK and the UE, or the Euro, sorry, the European Union, have in a number of sectors. For example, the automotive one, which is remarkable importance here in the Basque country and one where an agreement is fundamental given the margins, the small margins that those companies operate in that, in that sector. We should continue to work together to advance and protect our shared European values, liberal democratic values. And we start from a unique position in these discussions. Close regular, regular, regulatory alignment, trust in one another's institutions, and a spirit of cooperation stretching back decades. So, a new, strong, constructive partnership for a strong EU and strong UK. What Mrs. May's ambition is, certainty wherever possible, control over our own laws, strengthening the UK, maintaining the common travel agreement with Ireland, control of immigration, rights for EU nationals in Britain and British nationals in the EU, enhancing rights for workers, free trade with European markets, new trade agreements with other countries, a leading role in science and technology and innovation, cooperation on crime, terrorism and foreign affairs, and a phased approach to Brexit. That's the position. Thanks. Uh, I might be able to do it with my sheet of paper instead of, because Anfield's drawings are fantastic. Okay. Uh, all right, we'll stick, we'll stick with the drawings for our, our sound uh, team that was working with the screen. Uh, thank you, Derek. I know that uh, it was difficult politically for you to kind of uh, steer through some of those issues, but uh, I think that sets out a sort of nice uh, view of where the UK priorities are uh, for the for the upcoming negotiations, and I think it brings up some issues that Rocco can speak to quite uh, directly. There's concern about having a hard border uh, along Northern Ireland, uh, and obviously in Ireland, uh, and what that could mean, and that, of course, now being a top priority for both sides. So perhaps you could speak a little bit uh, okay. to that, and yeah. maybe more uh, yeah. more perspectives. Thank you. Okay. Um, 
Well, I, I had a PowerPoint presentation which would mess up this, and I think Angel's drawings are much better than my PowerPoint presentation. So I'll try and work from memory and from what I've been writing down here. Okay, so, um, well first, thanks very much to the organizers, and specifically to you, Caterina, and to Juanjo for, for inviting me and for this opportunity. And I'm gonna use it to talk about uh, basically the consequences the concerns of Brexit specifically for Ireland. Uh, and of course, uh, I think there would have been very few Irishmen that didn't wake up that day when they heard of the result and, and didn't think about our border with Northern Ireland. The economy was not an issue. It was our border with Northern Ireland. Um, just to explain this um, common travel area, you, you've got to remember that 100 years ago, Ireland was in the United Kingdom. It was part of the United Kingdom. All of the island of Ireland was. And um, in, there was a Government of Ireland Act to divide Northern Ireland from the South, but before it came into force in the South, uh, the South became um, the Irish Free State. Okay. And it only became a republic in 1937. Uh, until 1937, it seems that the British government considered, or was happy to consider, uh, citizens of the south of Ireland as British subjects, okay? Um, so we had this, we've always had this common travel area. It's only ever been interrupted during the troubles in Northern Ireland, and, and that was for security reasons. And when I say it was for security reasons, there were security controls. It was like a war zone on the border, okay? But now, if you cross, if any of you have done so, you'll know. Uh, sometimes it's difficult to know that you've crossed from uh, the south of Ireland into the north. It might be that you notice because the road surface changes, like when you go from, uh, from here to another province, because the authority that's responsible changes, or that the post box is red instead of green. Okay, um, but, uh, but otherwise there are no signs up saying welcome to Great Britain. Okay, it's, it's, it's completely subdued. And, and one obvious sign, of course, is the one that warns you that the speed limits are in miles when you enter Northern Ireland instead of kilometers, as in the south. <laughs> okay, but it's, that's, that's what the border is for us. Um, and, 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 and since, especially since the, the Good Friday Agreement and since there has been a, a period of, of peace and stability. That is the way the border is, completely invisible. Um, so the border, Brexit, or the referendum result, has already had an impact uh, on people living on the border. And in fact, I, I didn't think of this when, when, when I was in Bilbao yesterday, but now that I'm here in Donosti, uh, I do. I mean, there are people here that uh, live in, in, in France and work here and vice versa, okay? So you, you will understand this, but in, imagine that if that border came back, okay? And in Ireland, the border hasn't come back, but the, the pound has devalued. And there are people living in the Republic of Ireland, working in the north of Ireland with a salary in pounds, but they're paying an Irish mortgage, which has become considerably more expensive. So that, that, that effect was there from the day the pound devalued. There are children on one side of the border living on one side and going to school on the other. There are families, close families, with members on one side of the border, members on the other. There are farms that are split on both sides of the border, okay? Uh, local economy has been affected as well because obviously um, those that some time ago, it was worth their while traveling to the south because the pound was strong, now don't do this. So uh, businesses on the border, on the south side, are already suffering. So Brexit is already being noticed there. But I, I'll come back to the border uh, later on. Um, I've been following the Irish press, and the, the emphasis was on the border, the border, the border, our border. And then one day somebody said, well, we've got to start thinking about the economy as well. We've got to prepare for the changes the challenges, we've got to become more competitive, okay? So we're aware that there's a risk there. We're aware there's talk about business um, being lost and so on. But on the other hand, uh, a couple of days ago, I read that four big accountancy firms in Ireland, their profits have increased substantially since the Brexit referendum, 
okay? And, and, and it's taken to be down to business be coming towards Ireland instead of Britain. Other opportunities, um, the, uh, the Irish Bar Association, the Council of the Bar, the Colegio de Abogados, is, is saying that there will be opportunities for lawyers because uh, in contracts, international contracts, that London before was used as a forum, uh, maybe in, in the future Dublin will be chosen because uh, Ireland will remain in the European Union and thanks to uh, regulations that govern uh, jurisdiction and the execution of judgments, our judgments will continue to be uh, executed in the European Union, which may not be the case with British ones, or it may. Okay. Um, and other opportunities that come merely from the fact that we are going to be the English-speaking country left in the European Union. Um, I'll come back to language afterwards because that's a bit complicated as well, but, but that'll be the case. Um, then, of course, the Good Friday Agreement, and people have been saying, what will the impact be on this? I would like to think, and I was in Belfast um, tracing, well, I, I should have said it at the beginning, you've got a British consul with um, a, an Irish name, and you've got an Irish consul with an Italian <laughs> name, uh, but you've, go, you've also got uh, an American moderator with a Greek name, but that, that's the way the world spins. <laughs> okay. um, so my great-grandparents moved uh, to Belfast uh, over 100 years ago, and, and, and this year, this summer, I visited my great-grandfather's grave in Belfast. Uh, I don't think there's any risk of going back to the troubles that existed in Northern Ireland, okay? I, I don't think that's, that's at risk, okay? But th the peace agreement did have elements in it which could be relevant for what's going on now. Um, there are, for example, the peace agreement has power sharing, uh, power sharing institutions established, an assembly where, um, which appoints an executive where power is shared by uh, nationalists and unionists, uh, Catholics and Protestants. Uh, that's going to continue to be there. Um, there's the option uh, in the event of a majority of the people of Northern Ireland and also a majority of the people of the south of Ireland wanting uh, for the reunification of Ireland. And then there's a whole area of cross-border cooperation in important areas like health and transport. And of course the question is, if we've got a border there, obviously that, that will be effective. Okay. So that's one element of, of, of the Northern, uh, of the Good Friday Agreement that has to be taken into consideration. Um, the other issue is, Northern Ireland's choice, okay. Um, Jacques Delors was, I, I researched the uh, support program for peace and reconciliation when I started doing my thesis years ago. And um, he decided he wanted, he, it was his personal decision to put finance into Northern Ireland in support of the peace process, right. And, and Northern Ireland has benefited from European Union funding. And if you add to that that all nationalists would be pro-European Union, but also others that have benefited from funding, from traveling, from being in a more cosmopolitan society, it's obvious that Northern Ireland, despite the fact that unionist parties were officially pro-Brexit, 55% uh, of the people of Northern Ireland voted to stay. That percentage would uh, justify reunification with Ireland, but it wasn't enough to stop Brexit, okay? Uh, there are those, I'm saying it because there are those that have commented that in the formula for deciding to leave, one of the conditions should have been that Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland individually should also back Brexit, okay? But, but it wasn't the case. It was just an overall uh, majority. Um, the, the, the next thing, because virtually everything, I, well, not everything I have here has been touched on, but a lot of the things have. Um, the European Union's consideration of Ireland, um, Caterina also mentioned it, that in the guidelines uh, from the 29th of April, there's a specific paragraph in there that confirms support for supporting the, 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 the uh, peace process in Northern Ireland and so on, and our border and everything else. But there's something about it that worries me. It's all subject to respect for European Union law, okay? And this is like saying, well, you can do what you want, but you've got to respect the principles that everyone else in the European Union has to respect. So that means that, yes, 
it will be done, but there will be limits on it. We can't do what we want. Uh, that border is not going to be an issue that can be negotiated between the Irish government and the British government. They can speak about it, but whatever is established would need uh, the support of the European Union. Okay, uh, but, but, but the support has been expressed. And also I've read in the press, but I haven't been able to find the official document referring it to it, but also they apparently uh, support has been shown that for the integration of Northern Ireland in the European Union in the event that in the future uh, there were the, the island were reunified. Okay, but, but I wouldn't have been worried about that because we've also we've got the German precedent where uh, with the reunification of Germany, uh, East Germany joined. Um, right, nationality, um, because Derek said that for the, the United Kingdom, uh, there's this very special relationship with, 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 uh, with Ireland, but, but for, the, for, for we Irish as well, our relationship with the United Kingdom is very important. And I, I'll express a few things as we go along. But if we go back to the uh, Good Friday Agreement, the Good Friday Agreement recognizes that anyone born in Northern Ireland can choose to be either Irish, British, or both. Okay. Um, so what I'd say to you is that the, there has been a spectacular increase in the demand for first-time Irish passports since Brexit. Mm. Okay. Anyone living anywhere in the world who has a grandparent or a grandmother born in Ireland can apply for an Irish passport. Right? And in Northern Ireland, people were born, uh, they, they have this right under the Northern Ireland, the, the peace agreement, to apply for Irish passports. And at the uh, passport desk in Belfast, the increase in the demand for passports in the year January 2016 to January 2017 has seen an increase of 70%. Right? Um, even, even staunch unionists have said in public that, well, if we're entitled to the passport and we're interested in having it, let's be pragmatic, okay? So uh, there are people that would not otherwise have applied for an Irish passport, and now uh, they're applying for one, right? Um, other things that, 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 that we Irish are worried about. What about those of us that live in the United Kingdom or, or would like to live there in the future? Because we have always seen uh, the United Kingdom is somewhere where you could go and work. Um, I, I'm a qualified lawyer in, in Dublin, and my qualification was automatically recognized in, in London independently of anything to do with the European Union. And, and I can go and live in, in Britain and be treated. I, I, I won't be British, but, but I will not be considered foreign. Mm -hmm. And why? Because we've got a, a piece of British legislation from the 1940s which everyone had forgotten about until Brexit. It's the Ireland Act 1949, and it says that Ireland shall not be considered uh, a foreign country. And uh, this was after the Irish Republic was created. And it extends that definition to the citizens of Ireland. We're not considered aliens or foreign, okay? We're not considered British, but we're not considered foreign. What does it mean in practice that we exercise rights that apparently, as far as I'm aware, are, are the same as British people exercise, including the right to vote in all elections, okay? But then, what about British people living in Ireland? Well, we changed our constitution to allow uh, voting rights for British people living in Ireland in consideration of the fact that we had voting rights in Britain, okay? So, for example, um, I can't help expressing my say, deception at the fact that I've been living in Euskadi for 25 years next month, and I'm still not able to vote in, in elections here other than municipal elections and uh, European Parliament elections, but that's the way it is. Um, if, if I were living in, in Britain, I'd be able to vote in Parliament elections, and if I were British living in Ireland, I'd be able to vote in the elections to the Irish Parliament, okay, both houses of Parliament. Um, Right, then the last thing, and really, I, I presume that there's going to be a pragmatic, uh, a pragmatic decision on this, but uh, it, it does occur to me, when Ireland joined the European Union, or the European 
economic community as it was then, the common market. I used to see, I used to see uh, documentaries on it on TV in black and white. It seemed that the common market was about selling Irish cattle in other parts of Europe, okay? But obviously, it evolved into something more than that. Um, but when, when we joined, we did not ask for the Irish language to be an official language, okay? But um, a few years ago, when 10 new members joined, and languages like Maltese became official, uh, we asked for Irish to become an official language as well, okay? So now Ireland uh, has its own um, language as an official language in the European Union. So what happens to English when Britain leaves? Because, for example, English is a second official language in Ireland, and I, I think also in Malta, but both Irish and Maltese are official languages. In theory, there isn't a justification for English to continue to be an official language, but, but it has become a working language in the European Union. Uh, I, I know French is the official language of the Court of Justice, but if you go anywhere in any institution in the European Union and you speak English, um, you're not gonna have any problem. It has become the working language. So um, I, I, I've been looking for an official view on this and I haven't been able to find one. I find press cuttings, but I haven't find, found anything official. But it, it's there uh, as an issue, okay? And it would be a problem for Ireland because despite the fact that Irish is our official, first official language, uh, not many Irish people actually speak it. So uh, losing English as an official language in Europe would be a problem, okay? And I think I've remembered everything. <laughs> I would have liked to have seen the drawings, but <laughs> thank well, you. They'll definitely be, they'll, uh, they'll be available afterwards, and uh, forgive me, because since we, we spoke about the, the, the drawings, and I didn't properly introduce you, but I think as you probably extracted from uh, Rocco's intervention, right, formal legal background, uh, he actually received his doctorate from the University of the Basque Country, despite having uh, gotten his master's in Dublin, uh, and is uh, licensed to practice not only here, but as, as he mentioned, in Ireland, England, and Wales. Um, so one of the things that sort of joined some, both of your interventions is this sort of the UK seeking certainty, but yet, you know, Rocco, you hinted to so many points of uncertainty, and a lot of that can be handled with legal mechanisms. Um, I don't know if you could speak a little bit to that, like how do you think, you know, from a legal perspective, how could uh, more certainty being be accomplished in the next two years despite having a final agreement or even a future relationship being decided uh, within the next two years? Well, I, uh, what I'm worried about is that uh, there's so much to be negotiated. And I, I mean, every day you hear of new simple things, but like um, the civil servants, but also the pension rights of civil servants from the European uh, institutions, who's going to pay their their, their, their pensions and so on. Um, I, I did forget one thing, which was a risk of scribbling things down. The, there's, there is a, co this common travel area is already, has found its niche in the European Union structure in that um, for there to be a common travel area respected and with Britain not wanting to be in Schengen, in the Schengen arrangements relating to free movement, because they are in other arrangements, uh, Ireland remained out of Schengen as well. And therefore, um, you'll know this, if you've traveled to Britain, you've got to produce your passport. If you travel to Ireland, you've got to produce your passport. But if you then travel between Ireland and Britain, you don't, okay? And, and really, there's no reason why something like that should not continue in the future. Um, as regards the movement of people, what worries me most is if there isn't uh, a common customs tariff and you've got to control the origin of goods, um, how do you do it? I know we've, got, we've become computerized, but the, the volume of commerce is, is so much greater than, than it used to be that um, how do you control these things? Um, so I, I, I'm concerned, I, with time, everything can be resolved. Two years to me seems to be just impossible. I think it's one of the biggest concerns that we're, um, well, is, is the time frame. Um, but also one of the ideas is um, prioritizing and transitions. 
that, that, uh, that there will be a transition period. It depends how long that trans transition period is. But um, also what you said about um, the, the movement of goods, and if, um, if there is a return to uh, controlling that movement of goods to the extent of going back um, 30 years, whereby you have uh, customs agents uh, stamping forms which require costs, uh, which add to um, or remove competitivity of goods. Um, what am I trying to, to get at? If, if for example, uh, on, on the trade front, um, if you look at the, the trade between the Basque country and the United Kingdom, with respect to automotive components. Um, automotive components is one of the, the, the biggest commodities that moves between the Basque country and, and the UK. If um, there were, for example, no agreement with respect to, to, to tariffs or, or it, 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 it was hung at, uh, at the end of the negotiating period, hence I'm getting at the idea of transitions, but if you, if you applied rigorously um, that uh, in two years' time it's not sorted out, so uh, there's no deal, so what do the UK, or what would the UK do? Uh, the UK would re uh, make recourse to the World Trade Organization and the tariffs in force in the World Trade Organization. In the case of uh, automotive components, which I say, um, if you look at, look at companies here in the Bass country, one of the biggest investors in the UK in the automotive sector is Hestam, Meyer, um, from the Mondragon worker-owned cooperative movement. If, for example, you applied World Trade Organization tariffs, uh, a motor vehicle, uh, the tariff would be 10%. And a component could be anything between four to six percent. And the margins are so tight that a four to six percent tariff, even if it's reciprocal, and remember that in that sector you've got goods moving to be incorporated into a vehicle, the impact on the on, on the price would be such that you could see eventually the collapse of the sector. So the need for um, common sense, um, the need for um, transition. Um, but the, the, the automotive sector is, is particularly sensitive. Um, but going back to the idea of, uh, of if, we, if we look back in time, uh, customs agents stamping uh, uh, declarations, that all represents cost that all represents slowing down processes. It all represents um, creating lack of competitivity. And I shouldn't say it, but I don't think anyone in the 27 countries or the 28 countries at the moment that constitute the union wish to see us go back 30 years in, in simply a, a customs declaration form and what that represents as a cost. Well, I'd like to open it up now to your questions. Uh, so if anyone present, okay. I think we have a microphone. Uh, just one moment. <laughs> uh, for the video, we need, uh, we need just one moment. Oh, and for the translators as well. <laughs> Um, first and foremost, I, I have to say that the idea of Theresa May and the Conservative government protecting workers' rights is frankly laughable, but maybe that's a point for another day. However, I think when we talk about immigration, and I think the quote was that immigration in the UK has been quite high, what we need to look at is what immigration brings to the UK. So a recent study by a University College London 
showed that between 20, 2000 and 2011, 20 billion net was brought into the UK economy due to the contribution of immigrants. So consequently, what I would say is that Theresa May's recent focus on reducing net immigration is purely and simply economically illiterate. And as much as you can comment on that, I'd be quite interested to hear. Thank you. I can't. <laughs> I can't. Sorry. Yeah, I think that the PERDA does create some limitations. I don't know if... I, I'm not an economist. I, I've heard the same arguments here uh, in favor of immigration, that, that our immigrants in the Basque Country uh, provide a net gain, despite what is said. Um, by students into the UK, by foreign students studying in the UK. And I think really if we look at it, immigrants bring so many more benefits to a country than anything else. And it's a shame we have certain parties, political parties and certainly newspapers in the UK who desire to paint immigrants as some kind of evil wave surging over our country. And this is something we've got to fight against. And I really don't think that the current Conservative government standpoint is at all conducive to any kind of unification or any kind of strong Britain. It might be a strong Britain if we go back to the idea of when we were a colonial power, but certainly not anything for a future that I or many other workers both in Spain, Britain or throughout Europe would like to see. And I think it's about time that people realise that what we have here is what she likes to call a hard Brexit policy and what we're in very big danger of getting is Brexit for bankers. And Brexit that will only benefit those who already have more than they should have in the first place. And as somebody who you perhaps won't be surprised to hear voted Remain, then I think what we have to do is make sure that Theresa May knows that we do not want the kind of Brexit that she is currently fighting for. And personally, I'll make a political comment I can, I think what would benefit workers in the UK and throughout Europe is a Labour government led by Jeremy Corbyn. And I cross my fingers that we'll see that on the 8th of June. Other thoughts or questions from those present? I know that Derek probably can't respond, so maybe one of you can. both for your interventions, very interesting, and I understand the limitations that you come with under the current circumstances, but I'm surprised that uh, nobody has mentioned one word that seems to me fundamental if any of this is going to work well for anybody, and that's trust. Okay, it's all very well to talk about, or for Prime Minister May to talk about the need for respect in negotiations. But negotiations don't work without trust, and trust needs building and it needs maintaining from before they start. That means appearing before 10 Downing Street and accusing EU people, senior people, of attempting to influence the outcome of the UK, upcoming UK elections does not look like attempt to build trust. To me, it points the other way. As somebody who's lived here 23 years, again, suffering democratic deficits of not being to vote in any of the parliaments that affect me, uh, except the European Parliament and the Town Hall, who don't collect my taxes or spend them, I wasn't able to vote in the referendum for Brexit. So, I want to see where is trust going to be built and by who and how. And I appreciate all, both your uh, comments and thoughts on this, but I don't see how they point to who is going to be doing this and when. Because two years, as both of you have said, is not going to easily bring us to a sensible, workable uh, arrangement for everybody. And that, 
from my point of view, has got to include me. Yeah, uh, uh, Derek's got a time limitation because elections are coming up to talk about his government. I can't talk about his government anyway. Um, but what I think is, if you say, uh, what, what do I think is going to make it work? It's pragmatism and interest. And that's common on both sides. Like, I, I, I think both sides stand to lose if they're not pragmatic. And I know there's arguments saying, you know, it can't be, we ca it can't be seen to be easy for Britain and so on. And then, you know, there are statements to soften that by saying it's not a penalty, it's what they owe. It'll be a pragmatic arrangement that everyone is going to uh, gain from. Um, I mean, I, I, I know how the Northern Ireland Good Friday Agreement was, was negotiated, and that was pragmatism mm -hmm. and foresight. And, um, and, and people looked like they were losing, but, but someone had to show them that in the long term they were going to gain, which has been the case. And, and this is a bigger, maybe, issue economically, but, but I think both sides will be pragmatic. I agree fully uh, with what you've said there, Oko. Um, I, I, I can't comment on the, on the concept of trust. Um, what I can say is that um, the, the UK has a relationship with, the, with the, the UK and governments in the past and present governments have a long-standing relationship with the EU. Um, EU states and EU politicians, Mrs May has had numerous conversations with uh, leaders in the European countries. She's made her point. Uh, we are in election times and we're at the start of a negotiation period and at times negotiators uh, tend to spar. And uh, then when you stop the sparring, you get down to the serious stuff. Yeah, this morning I was in my negotiation course and a number of uh, the students are here today and as they could tell you and any trained negotiator can tell you, it comes down to common interest. Trust with, lack of trust will derail any negotiation. But if you can establish common interest, which we've heard on both sides, there are a series of common interests, right? You negotiate because it's what you need to do because you can't do better on your own. Uh, and I think for both sides, mm -hmm. that stands true. So they need one another to varying degrees. And the commonality of the interests also vary, but there's enough for a negotiation to go forward. Uh, and what we're seeing, uh, anything that is evidencing a lack of trust, I think, is ultimately strategy. Yeah. I mean, uh, something, an example. Um, one of the greatest European projects, I think, um, is Airbus. <coughs> Um, is Airbus going to collapse because of Brexit? Is, uh, is, is the introduction of tariffs going to prevent that wing spans in Wales don't find themselves to Toulouse? Uh, at the end of the day, um, there will be a prioritization of interests and there will be a prioritization of sectors. And the negotiators will look at those sectors and the respective impacts that they have on the respective economies and somebody will say, how many jobs are we going to lose thanks to being thrown up barriers? And one of the things that we can ask is, um, if you're sitting at a, at a negotiating table, uh, what barrier do you want to throw up? We're not wanting to throw up barriers. To, uh, there is no signs in the, uh, in the UK of movements of protectionism. What we're seeking is a free trade area or a free trade relationship with the EU, but a reciprocal agreement. So we're not going to throw up barriers. So if we have someone in front of us or we have, I'm not going to name a country, what barrier do you want to put, put in place? Pragmatism. Other questions? <coughs> See a hand here in the front. Hi. Um, as a, a British person, I'm unhappy about what I see as the 
very negative effects of Brexit which are coming, and I think they're definitely going to come, um, and I don't see any way around that. Um, but what terrifies me more, what terrified me on June 24th, and still terrifies me more, is the idea that from this so-called contagion will start, and this uh, virus will start to spread to other countries, because I think my generation has forgotten what Europe looks like without union, but there are still people alive today who do remember. Um, and it's all very well to talk about pragmatism, but the pragmatism doesn't, isn't just a function of the relationship between Britain and the EU. The EU also has to be pragmatic about itself and the, um, protecting its own union. So as uh, Europe level people in the know, I was wondering if you could comment on, firstly, um, what risk do you consider there is now how the land lies now, of contagion to other countries? And secondly, how do you think that fear of contagion is going to affect the EU's negotiating position? Because as far as I can see, the EU's hands are fairly tied. And if Britain comes out of this as this globe-straddling economic behemoth that Theresa May has in her mind, then what kind of effect is that going to have on other populist, I don't know, whatever you want to call them, movements in other countries? Well, Holland survived the test, the Netherlands, and as recently as last Sunday, France uh, did. Um, I, I think possibly what has happened along the way is that Maybe, maybe it all moved uh, too fast, too far and too fast for everyone. Uh, so for some are comfortable with the way it's going, um, and then others might not be. Um, also, um, maybe being a bit realistic, countries leaving and their impact it, it, it varies, it would vary on what country it is that's leaving. Um, I think with, with, with uh, the United Kingdom, it's, it's because we're talking about such a big economy that is so important for the European Union. But the other big economies seem to be standing firm. So could it, could there be, you know, could this pass on to others? Well, it could, but at the moment, um, where there was worry. I mean, the next test will be in Germany with the elections there. Mm. But, but it seems that, it seems that the, the, the nucleus of Europe, what was always there, is still staunchly European. Um, Britain hasn't always been 100% convinced about this project. I mean, I'm, I'm not saying it, uh, it I, I can say it, but I'm saying it on the basis of certain facts. Like, uh, it didn't join the Euro uh, and it didn't join the Schengen sure. arrangement uh, to keep those controls. Um, but, but maybe, you know, more consideration should have been made for that, that viewpoint when it wasn't. And then there are other countries that are delighted with the Euro and with Schengen. I mean, for, I've got family in Italy and I can cross France by car and use the same currency and no controls and it's great. Um, so, uh, but I think maybe that not consideration wasn't taken as we were moving along, that maybe this doesn't suit everyone. All, all, all I can say with there is um, two, two numbers, and maybe that'll give you an, an idea of what I'm saying. 52% um, for leaving, 48% for staying. Get all, I see three hands, maybe we can put all the questions out and then leave them open to the speakers. Muy bien. Yo, yo voy a expresarme en, en castellano porque es una cuestión técnica, perdona que te dé la espalda. Eran dos, tres cuestiones, ¿no? La primera, si se puede contestar en relación a Escocia, ¿no? Y a la dimensión 
importante que implica la relegitimación sobrevenida con un elemento tan catártico como puede ser un Brexit que implique la pérdida de todo lo que representa un valor para Escocia. ¿no? Eh, sea en el momento que sea, eso plantea un problema importante porque puede ser la primera verdadera ampliación interna de la Unión Europea y producirse la llamativa situación de que el Estado del que proviene la ampliación interna se va y una parte de ese Estado se integra con ciudadanos que son eh, europeos desde 1973, que tiene todo el acervo europeo incluido en su legislación y si Croacia ha tardado 13 meses en entrar, el último, el vigésimo octavo Estado, Escocia, en un mes podría ser Estado europeo. ¿no? La segunda cuestión es que respecto de los derechos de las personas mmm, todavía no se ha invocado la Convención de Viena sobre Derecho de los Tratados. ¿no? Existe eh, un principio de salvaguarda de los derechos adquiridos de buena fe costando tratado y por lo tanto yo creo que eso no debe de ser objeto de negociación. Que los derechos de quienes ya están allí y de los británicos que están en Europa en la medida en que pertenezcan y continúen en el Estado donde han adquirido sus derechos no se pueden ver alterados. Y creo que ese debe de ser un elemento no negociable porque hay derecho convencional. ¿no? Y el tercero y definitivo es que eh, hablamos de negociación, de pragmatismo, de buena fe, pero las cosas son lo que son. ¿no? Eh, y si el Brexit es el que dice Teresa May que va a ser, es imposible negociar. No te puedes quedar con el bombón que te gusta de la agenda y el que no te gusta tirarlo. Es imposible, no se trata de tener actitud vengativa, sino que es un todo y hasta el mejor negociador del mundo, que es el mundo británico, no va a poder resolver ese nudo gordiano. Porque, ¿cómo resuelves la cuestión de los 250 bancos extranjeros en Londres, que, agrup que agrupan a casi 2.500 puestos de trabajo, que están en Londres porque tienen ficha bancaria europea para el resto de estados? El, el 29 de marzo del 2019, o se van a Irlanda, o se van a Londres, o se van a Frankfurt, o se vienen a Donosti, o dejan de tener ficha bancaria, o tratado, y por tanto negocias que aceptas como Noruega las cuatro libertades sin ser europeo, o traslado. La playa de sociedades constituidas interesadamente en el Reino Unido, a partir del 29 de marzo, no es que dejen de ser europeas, dejan de tener personalidad jurídica por estar mal constituidas. Y todos sus socios pueden ser objeto de responsabilidad. O se van a un país europeo, o si se quedan en el Reino Unido tienen un serio problema. Todas las empresas online del juego en Gibraltar y en el Reino Unido, que el año pasado han facturado 76.000 millones, o se vienen a una ubicación europea o solo pueden mercadear entre el Reino Unido y Londres, luego no tienen negocio, o se trasladan o el tratado prevé todo eso. ¿Cómo pretenden resolver todo esto? Porque es imposible que el Brexit que dice la autoridad política británica que va a existir, exista y se continúe pensando que es factible. Y por último, los 70 convenios, citando la posibilidad de acuerdos bilaterales, ¿el Reino Unido va a poder negociar 70 convenios en un mes con 70 estados eh, a los que ya pertenece la Unión Europea? Porque le van a resultar ya no de aplicación. ¿no? Y mi pregunta es si más que pragmatismo hay que hablar con realismo ¿no? y reconocer que el Brexit que se ha planteado políticamente es un suicidio para el Reino Unido para su economía, a pesar de ser la cuarta economía mundial, y que sencillamente o se negocia con realismo y se dejan prepotencias y narcisismos sobrevenidos por unos y por otros, o es un absolutamente, absoluto caos, el peor escenario de negociación, donde pierden las dos partes, pero pierde evidentemente mucho más el que se va. No, Entonces, no sé qué tipo de negociación se puede plantear después de las elecciones y del corsé dialéctico que implica que haya elecciones, pero es que no es cuestión de pragmatismo, sino de sentido común, ¿no? Y ojalá se instale, porque nadie le sea nada malo a ningún pueblo, al británico, por supuesto, tampoco, pero sería un suicidio anticipado llevar adelante las decisiones que se están previendo, ¿no? ¿no? sé si hay sesudos informes en el Reino Unido que recojan esto, pero es imposible, y perdón que me haya alargado, la descapitalización tan brutal que puede representar para el Reino Unido todo eso en el mundo de los negocios, ¿eso se resuelve bajando 10 puntos el impuesto de sociedades?, me parece que no. Es vivir en la Arcadia feliz, pensar que eso puede atraer una inversión que va a dejar de tener 400 millones de consumidores europeos a su servicio solo tocando la tecla de Irlanda o de cualquier otro país. ¿no? Eso es lo que quería reflexionar y plantear. No, muchas gracias, Juanjo. We're going to, I think, get all the 
the que that I saw two hands. Get, um, all the questions on at least have one round and let you respond to, to it all. Thank you. Um, I would like to raise a question that actually looks a bit more at the perspective of the citizens. And the issue, on, from my personal side, I'm, I'm one of these future controlled migrants in the UK as well as here. Um, in the UK, it became quite clear that, that within the Brexit debate and afterwards, we had a very high rise of racism and xenophobic attacks. I live in the northern city of um, Hull, which we had 70%, 69% um, leave voters, and we had an extreme element of racism going through with this. And I'm actually addressing much more than the negotiation and the political part of it, the question of what does it do to the population of the country, what does it do to the divide that is happening within and that is showing through Brexit, the divide within the own country. And I would ask for a comment on the respect of how does it affect the citizens in the country, the citizens living together that have migrants around them, that migrants living with these citizens, um, to bring forward a bit more the social side, except for just looking at the political, economic, and negotiation side. We got one more, Edu, if in the back. Thank you, Katarina. My question is really linked to the ones that, that Paco has met. Uh, my question is, what would happen if when it reaches 29th of March of 2019 and there is no agreement between the EU and the UK, uh, the UK sorry, from both a legal and political perspective? Thank you. Okay, so lots of issues on the table. Uh, uh, I don't know, in any order, if you would like to begin. Well, one call, um, start with um, Scotland. Um, Scot Scotland, oh, wait, in Castle, uh, Scotia is un, un, un pertenece a, a la Unión en virtud del hecho de que es miembro de, de Gran Bretaña. Uh, supongamos que hay un referéndum y Escocia de, uh, decida que quiere, quiere dejar la, la, la Reino Unido. Um, para acceder al, al, a la comunidad europea haría falta unánime, unánime, un voto unánime entre los 27 uh, miembros de, de la Unión. Ahí, ahí, ahí lo dejo. Ahí lo dejo. Eh, la ficha bancaria, efectivamente, complicadísima. Eh, y es cuestión de negociar esa, esa relación. Lo que me viene a mente cuando, por ejemplo, eh, has mencionado que vendrá o movimientos hacia... Eh, igual en Nueva York, hacia Singapur, uh, un, un desplazamiento. Tenemos el caso del, del, del European Medical Agency en, en Londres, que, que, que se trasladará. Eh, y, y Barcelona, Barcelona está eh, luchando de una forma muy importante y muy hábilmente para traer la agencia a, a su ciudad. Y, y enhorabuena si, si llegue. Pero hay un contrato de alquiler de ese edificio en que está ubicado la agencia con una empresa de Qatar que representa 40 millones de euros hasta 2050 que el que consigue la agencia tendrá que respetar. ¿Qué quiero decir con eso? Que todo es muy complicado y no hay nada blanco y negro. Eh, yo creo que, que todo el mundo reconoce que, claro, eh, el artículo 50 tiene sus condiciones y son dos años, pero hasta Mrs. May está implícitamente reconociendo que hay que priorizar y extender en el tiempo eh, los, los plazos. Y, y, comentado también y, y creo 
aunque no es, no es el sentido más corriente entre, entre los humanos y entre nosotros, que en un momento determinado el sentido común va a, va a dominar. Yo, yo estoy, de, estoy de acuerdo con lo que dice Derek, que hace falta tiempo y creo que también si hace falta prórroga, habrá prórroga. Sobre todo cuando pensamos que la prórroga no la quieres si perjudica a una de las partes, pero en este caso, para mí que haya 20 prórrogas. Es decir, todo sigue igual y ya llegaremos a un acuerdo. Eh, por otra parte... Eh, yo soy de esos irlandeses que cuando me dejan en casa veo la BBC, que a veces es en el ordenador, en la cocina, los domingos por la mañana. Pero eh, hay un partido político, los, social, los, liber, los liberaldemócratas, que están diciendo, eh, su postura es, vale, votamos a favor de lo que íbamos a dejar, pero no, no, hemos, no sabíamos dónde nos íbamos a meter. Entonces, cuando finalmente haya un acuerdo más o menos eh, plasmado, se debería, ellos, según ellos, debería haber un segundo referéndum sobre ese acuerdo, para que la gente vea, pueda decidir entre realmente no solo lo que deja, sino eh, dónde iría. Um, the, the, the other thing, the, the, the effect on racism, all I know about it is, is what I see on the news. And it, it's completely subjective. I, I wouldn't know what to say to you. All I know is that basically um, immigrants are always a soft target, okay? And, um, and that's the way it is. And um, I mean, I, I don't know, I, I was brought up in Ireland with uh, an, Irish, an Italian name and, you know, to people or some of the people around me, I wasn't very Irish, okay? Um, you know, when people have to take it out on someone, that the immigrants the easy target. Uh, when I watch the news, I see um, racist attacks, but, but, but I see racist attacks in other parts of the world. I, I don't have statistics. There was a time when it did seem that there was an effect, but what I don't know is, is that the press? Because depending on what they focus in on, they can make you believe anything. Or, or is, it, is there really an impact? And I think for that, I mean, it would be official statistics that would show. I, I, I just don't know. Uh, uh, the final question was the possibility of having a no deal. Uh, mm -hmm. el, el deseo, el deseo es que, or the, 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 the wish, the desire is that there is a deal. Um, if there's not a deal, then we may find ourselves in the World Trade Organization situation with respect to, to trade, and we start applying tariffs and the like. Um, frankly, I don't believe we'll reach that stage. I think the, the, the problem is if there's no deal and there isn't, um, you know, there isn't an extension. If there's no deal but we extend the time to reach a deal, then... Hmm. And I, I can't see that not happening. There's too much on the table. It's impossible to, uh, to negotiate all this in two years with external arrangements with other bodies and everything else. It's also, the European Council negotiation guidelines themselves uh, note that there won't be a full agreement. There will be uh, some sort of soft agreement on what a future agreement could look like. Right? Withdrawal can happen regardless of any other negotiated agreement. Uh, the only thing that is definite, uh, unless both parties agree, is that on the 29th of March, at, or at least at midnight on the 30th, mm -hmm. the EU treaties and protocols will cease to apply. Every other possibility could mm -hmm. just be extended in another negotiation context beyond that. Uh, you had your hand? Yeah. But do you really think, um, sincerely, that if there is no deal, the EU will be willing to to make I mean on to agree on some time extension because I, I, I agree with Juanjo when he said that uh, the the EU's negotiating guidelines are not the same as the Theresa May Theresa May one so that's that's why my, my concern is that I don't believe I don't really believe that the EU will be willing of extending the the negotiating time. 
are, are, what, what do you believe about that one? I can't answer. I, I, I'd go back to the pra pragmatism that I said before. If, if, um, if the European Union sees that what is about to happen, happen is not of interest to the European Union, I'm sure I, I would like to think that the European Union would consider, uh, and if, if it was in the interest and of both sides, to extending that beyond 2019. Uh, just on two points, because we had received an online question earlier. I wanted to, to talk a little bit more about Scotland and Gibraltar. Uh, so on the issue of Scotland, we received a question from Xavi Efezalarena asking, will the UK government accept a new referendum in Scotland before or after formal agreement on Brexit with the EU? Uh, and on the term, uh, on the question of Gibraltar, just your thoughts, uh, in the EU negotiation guidelines, uh, it stated that after the UK leaves the Union, no agreement between the EU and the United Kingdom may apply to the territory of Gibraltar without the agreement between the Kingdom of Spain and United Kingdom. So your thoughts on, on either issue, Scotland, Scotland and or Gibraltar? I think with respect to Scotland, I've answered that before when I answer, when I spoke to Juan Juan, where, where you can reach uh, what's admissible, if there's a, re a referendum, etc. But at the end of the day, uh, accession to the European Union uh, rests with the 27, uh, uh, by that time, member states. And the agreement has to be unanimous. And there, there, there I leave it. Uh, with respect to Gibraltar, um, it's one, and I apologize, but I think I can, I, I can say something about Gibraltar that is, is, is not political, but um, I, I've been there on quite a few occasions for work, and let's put it this way, when the 96% of Gibraltarians who voted in favour of staying in the European Union heard that piece of news, it would have made them pretty uneasy. And I leave it at that as well. Well, there is a proposal from the Spanish government having co-sovereignty. Uh, we're not sure how that will play out. Um, more questions or thoughts from those present? Okay, we have a question here uh, in the front. exactly the status of Noruega? respecto de la Unión Europea, ¿por qué no ves ese estatus aplicable al Reino Unido? Si tiene que ver, lógicamente, con el tema de la libertad de movimientos de personas. Y si, como europeísta y socialista que eres de la cuestión, ¿no crees que todo esto del Brexit refleja también a un desbarre que se ha podido producir en la aplicación del principio de la libre circulación de personas? Me ha parecido entender que la proporción de gente que se ha incorporado al Reino Unido ha sido muy superior a la de otros países. Y si ese fenómeno no tenía que haberse controlado eh, reglamentaria, o sea, en la reglamentación europea, un poco más eh, para evitar esa sensación que ha habido en el Reino Unido. Eh, bueno, no sé. ¿Y cómo? Por completar, eh, antes has mencionado Chipre, Gibraltar, eh, los paraísos fiscales, sí, sí. Eh, eso no ha podido influir también en el Brexit, el, cómo se está atacando a ese tipo de eh, bueno, formas de esconder el dinero ¿no? de, de la Unión Europea. Permite, Rocco y Derek, comento, eh, bueno, primero, Noruega es un país que decidió no entrar en la Unión Europea pero que entendió que las cuatro libertades de circulación, algo parecido ocurre con Suiza, eh, donde también se aplica Schengen, eh, le interesaba desde el punto de vista del intercambio. Con Islandia hay algo parecido también, pero Noruega es el ejemplo clarísimo que ha dicho yo no quiero someterme eh, a la soberanía de Bruselas, pero acepto equiparar mis estándares normativos a las cuatro libertades de circulación de personas, de servicios, de mercancías y de capitales. 
no pertenezco al euro, pero cumplo los requisitos para que el euro pueda ser una moneda de cambio libre en Noruega. Los ciudadanos noruegos no votan al Parlamento Europeo porque no son Europa, pero se benefician de las libertades de circulación. Están en el programa Erasmus, por ejemplo. Las mercancías circulan sin aranceles y hay libertad recíproca a un ámbito y a otro. Y los servicios exactamente igual. Ese estatus sería un estatus perfectamente factible, reivindicando la independencia de Bruselas, adaptando una legislación europea, convirtiéndola en británica, equiparando los estándares y pudiendo participar. Es la única manera a través de la cual participar. No podemos dar al Reino Unido lo que no podemos dar al resto de Estados porque es un PAC eh, en su integridad. ¿no? Y por lo tanto, sería factible, pero implicaría que los dirigentes políticos británicos reconocieran que el Brexit que plantean no es tal, sino que es una salida de la soberanía que supuestamente cedemos a Europa a cambio de seguir obteniendo los beneficios desde hoy. ¿no? Lo segundo es que el Reino Unido pudo, cuando en el 2004 entraron Polonia, Hungría, República Checa, Eslovaquia, Eslovenia, Estonia, Lituania, Malta, Chipre, pudo, como por ejemplo hizo España, poner un periodo de carencia de dos años limitando el acceso de los nacionales de esos países. Cuando hablamos de inmigración europea estamos hablando de Polonia, Pérez. En el Reino Unido el problema se llama Polonia y los polacos. Y yo no estoy demonizando a Polonia, pero es que el Reino Unido decidió porque necesitaba en ese momento en su mercado de trabajo trabajadores no aplicar ninguna exigencia de entrada, aplicar directamente las libertades. Si tú has querido que entren cuando te interesaba, ¿quieres echarles cuando no te interesa? Porque el resto de estados decidimos que poníamos un plazo hasta saber exactamente qué podía ocurrir. Y entre tanto, ya conseguimos con las libertades europeas conquistar el mercado polaco, como lo hicieron los franceses con las redes de distribución. O sea que Europa no te interesa para lo que no te interesa y sí te interesa para el business, ¿no? Y bueno, hablar de paraísos fiscales, yo creo que eh, la oportunidad para el Reino Unido respecto a Gibraltar es muy claro. Gibraltar, Gibraltar es un paraíso fiscal porque en 1973 el Estado español no pudo negociar porque no estaba en Europa y se pactó un régimen aduanero inexistente, una liberalización de los capitales también inexistente y evidentemente eso se tiene que negociar porque si ese territorio ya no está... En el ámbito europeo, la negociación ya no es con Europa respecto al Reino Unido-Gibraltar, sino entre España y Gibraltar. Y Chipre es un escándalo dentro de Europa. En Chipre, por 300.000 euros, compras la nacionalidad británica. Los rusos lo están haciendo, los bancos rusos están conquistando Chipre y es un ejemplo negativo desde todo punto de vista. ¿no? Pero yo no he visto Estado que haya obtenido más beneficio de las cuatro libertades que la City londinense manteniendo la libra desde ese ámbito. Entonces, Eliminar ese privilegio que han logrado obtener negociando desde el primer día en que llegaron y quitarte de en medio en ese planteamiento es tirarse una bala en el pie. Yo lo veo desde ese punto de vista. Yeah, as a British citizen resident in Spain, I, I would like to say something on Gibraltar, and I couldn't agree more. Gibraltar has more businesses actually registered there for tax purposes than it does citizens. And most of those are from the online gaming industry. So what does that, what benefit does that bring? As has just been said, Gibraltar is purely and simply a tax haven that is controlled by the British government or presided over by the British government, as most tax havens in the world are. And incidentally, if you look at Theresa May's voting record before she was Prime Minister, she was very happy to vote against any action being taken on tax havens. Gibraltar does not belong to the UK, purely and simply because it was gifted to us many, 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 many years ago, does not make it ours. And the only people who suffer because of what they do and because of how they operate as a tax haven are the British people and the Spanish people. And the sooner that's recognized and the sooner that people in my country, some people in my country, and certainly the government of the day, forget, pretends that it's, or stops pretending that it's some kind of issue likened to the Malvinas, which we also, in my opinion, have no right over either, the better. And the sooner that my government, or the government of the UK, I'd prefer not to call the current one my government, shuts all tax havens throughout the world that it presides over, the better for everybody throughout the world. And Gibraltar is a prime example of that. Before opening it up, 
Uh, also, we have a question here, if you can pass the microphone. I just want to, uh, for the sake of, of Derek, uh, who graciously agreed to be here tonight, just to be clear, you know, because of PERDA, it's not an avoidance of answering questions. I'm sure he probably would love to speak freely and openly. And this is something will be, you know, from the European Dialogues Project, this is a topic that we've already discussed. It will be a to topic we speak about again, for sure. So hopefully at that point, you'll be able to speak more freely. But I just wanted to take a little bit of the pressure off of him. Uh, I'm, because I'm, I'm sure inside he's dying to tell us things. Uh, but anyhow, uh, please, your question. Sorry, I want to change a little bit the subject. I, I want to, to know, uh, speaking about the uh, official language in the UK, and uh, you. Uh, microphone, holding it close. Ah, vale. uh, speaking about uh, of, uh, official languages in the EU, uh, what do you think uh, about what he did, uh, Jan Claude Juncker, uh, last week, speaking in English rather than speaking in French? In one, why, why did he did? He did uh, for kidding or for he was it a joke or I don't know. I think I think you have to ask him. <laughs> no. I mean, even the chief negotiator for the EU, Michel Renier, last week, he kept switching between English and French. Uh, <laughs> I repeat, it's a question for him, not for me. <laughs> I think I saw another hand. Uh. <laughs> Bueno, eh, como tú no, no puedes, eh, usted no puede comentarlo, le voy a hacer la pregunta a Juanjo, perdón por... No, no, es, es que no, es de, desde mi profunda ignorancia. Yo, siguiendo los medios de comunicación, eh, a veces veo la, la sal gorda, ¿no? el trazo grueso. Entonces, lo que, se, lo que se transmitió de la última reunión que hubo es que Europa fue con una factura a, a negociar con Teresa May y Teresa me dijo que, que de qué iban, que, no, ellos, que ellos no tenían que pagar nada. ¿Por qué tienen que pagar algo? O sea, yo me quiero ir, eh, ¿por qué tiene que pagar Inglaterra? Y simplemente eso. O sea, o sea que, que, que el inglés igual medio y tal dice, Oye, ¿por qué quieren esta gente que, que paguemos? ¿no? Nos vamos y fuera. Gracias. Es tan sencillo como que... Eh, los contratos están en vigor hasta el momento en que se resuelven, ¿no? Entonces, hay, actualmente hay unos compromisos eh, financieros presupuestarios ya asumidos eh, hasta el 2019. Lo que se dice es, bueno, el día en que resolvamos este contrato, porque usted decide irse, las obligaciones de contribución que tiene pendientes están en vigor. Eso suma aproximadamente 60.000 millones de euros. Eh, en, el, en la cifra neta anual... Eh, el Reino Unido es uno de los cuatro estados que más contribuyen al presupuesto de la Unión Europea, pero el, la cifra resultante neta es positiva para el Reino Unido cada año, cada ejercicio, al margen del cheque británico en su momento y de todo ello. Hoy día no existe esa compensación, pero obtiene eh, un beneficio importante desde ese ámbito. La, las cifras son oficiales, pero no es que se le gire una factura por irse, sino los compromisos vigentes hasta el momento en que te vas… Están diferidos por quinquenios, pero por cinco años, pero son circunstancias que hay que hacer efectiva en la negociación. Podrá dif quedar diferido, pero en el debe no es un, un pago punitivo porque te vas, sino porque hay una obligación de contribuir al sostenimiento de las instituciones europeas, de la misma manera que hasta el 29 de marzo del 2019 van a seguir beneficiándose de los presupuestos europeos en lo que implicara. Por lo tanto, no hay una actitud de de castigar al disco lo que se va, sino de cumplir las obligaciones que de buena fe tú has decidido. Y esa cifra hoy día suma 60.000 millones de euros que habrá que precisar en el momento en que, en que se salgan. Y, y añadiría, Juanjo, en ese sentido, mm -hmm. se ha tardado una década en llegar a un acuerdo sobre el cupo vasco. Por lo tanto, negociaciones sobre pagos siempre son complicadas. I don't know if there's one, any final question before closing this evening. No? Uh, 
Well, uh, before we close, I'd also just like to invite you all to our event next week, which uh, Juanjo will be chairing on the transforming unemployment into youth job creation. We'll have with us next week Stanislav Rangelev, who comes from the European Commission. He's the ultimate responsible for coordinating the European Social Fund, the many millions that the European Union is investing to creating jobs uh, for our young people and turning around this issue of unemployment. Uh, also, we'll have Garbina Henry, who's the Director of Social Innovation uh, from Deust University, and students, uh, those who are actually facing uh, some of these issues, current and recent graduates. Uh, also, thank you so much both to Rocco Kaira and to Derek Doyle. Uh, Juanjo as well, thank you for your inputs, and especially because today is his birthday. I so. <laughs>